uh, what? I believe the microphone's on now. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Donna Murnahan. I'm the Provost Vice President Academic and Research Interim. And I'm really privileged to actually be the MC for today's prestigious event. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice to have you here. But I'm welcoming those who are present. But also, I'd like to welcome those who are here virtually as well. So I'm not sure how many are online, but uh, we hope they hear us well. So in between, everybody has to use the microphone in order for it to work for us. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of Tecumlups to Swetmuk for the Kamloops campus and the talk for Williams Lake campus within Swetmuk Wulu the traditional and unceded territory of the Swetmuk people. This land is so important to our university, to our students, to our community, to our region of, of, and our interior BC. And all of us are very privileged, I say, to live, to work, and to play on this territory. And we're only able to do so because we honor our people. I'd like to start off our day in a good way by inviting a very special person. Joanne Brown is a member of the Chestiata Carrier Nation and currently one of four elders from the Elder in the House program at Capulton Indigenous Student Centre on campus. And I'd like to invite her to the podium to welcome everybody. Joanne. Yeah. Now, where do I put this piece of paper? We're getting, I'm just going to gently set it on your. <laughs> Joanne Brown Sahatni, Hadi Siyane. I'm a member of the Lisil Yu clan of the Chislata Carrier people. I've been a, a visitor in Sequetmik Ulu for the past 27 years, but I go home often. And I've, I've spent most of those 27 years up here on the campus. So I, I had the honor of meeting a great number of faculty and students and staff and administration who work here. So thank you, Donna, for the Tumuk acknowledgement, the acknowledgement of the land. And it's my honor to be asked to do the welcome and the dedication to the territory. So um, today we had a gorgeous day. And the great, beautiful sun that was out there is the big generator that gets things happening for us, right? In this solar system, we're lucky to have one beautiful blue planet that supports life, right? And um, that one beautiful blue planet has the wherewithal to support life for all of us and for everything. We recognize, as William Shatner so aptly put it, that there is a very thin veil of atmosphere around the planet. And I believe him very thin. We recognize that that little blue planet, this planet we call Earth, has a finite number of resources on it. And it has a finite number of, of living things on it. The biodiversity that's on this planet is truly amazing. With a thought to all of the wonderful beings that, that are on this planet, we have human beings who also make it very pleasant to live on this wonderful planet. And in the archaeological record, we see that this area, Sequentmakulu, is home to some of the largest projectile points there are in North America. And this beautiful area on the other side of the river has Paleo-Indian sites on it. And those Paleo-Indian sites are 
the very old ones, you know, like butting up against the last ice age, the Wisconsin ice age. So following on the heels of that, there is Gore Creek Man. And Gore Creek Man is one of the oldest um, remnants of the Sequetmic people that we have. And he, too, rivals the pyramids. So he's quite old. <laughs> and probably if they could do a DNA sample, which I'm sure that they're going to do, but he's been around for a long time. He's not going anywhere. But anyway, just to, just to understand how old the current inhabitants, the Sequetmic people are, they have very old blood running through their, their veins. And to honor that always and to keep it in mind. And with that, I'm not going to keep anybody anymore. I just want to say, Cooks Chechem, and that's thank you in Sequetmik scene, but also Snachalia, which means I honor you for listening to me. Thank you, Joanne. Joanne has a long, beautiful history working here at TRU. And for her to come back and work with us as an elder in the house, we truly appreciate. And so thank you very much for your kind words, for the blessing that will start us in the right way. And it's always totally appreciated, so kind words. Thank you very much. And the next, I'd like to introduce our president, Dr. Brett Fairbairn, who's going to give us a few words as well. Let's see if I can do this as well as Elder Joanne did. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, it's okay, Matt. I think everything's fine for the presentation. It's, uh, it's all good. It's all good. Um, White, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming to this very special event. Um, and thank you uh, to um, Elder Joanne for grounding us and starting us off in such a good way and locating us in our solar system and on our planet and on these lands. Um, that's a wonderful, wonderful grounding for a very special event. Um, my name is Brett Fairbairn. It's a, my great pleasure to be president and vice chancellor at TRU, and an especially great pleasure at an event like this. It's always exciting to have a first. And this is a first. It's our inaugural uh, professorial lecture. Um, so this is a really exciting and really significant event for TRU. Um, this event is a celebration of the academic career journey and of an academic career journey. Um, the academic path, as uh, many of us know, is not an easy one. Um, professors, full professors, are people who have proved themselves. Um, they've been acknowledged by their peers locally and uh, regionally, nationally and internationally, and have been recognized as leaders in their fields and people who've made a difference in the lives of students and colleagues and of communities. The promotion process is a rigorous one. There's a lot of effort that's required. It needs dedication and it needs passion to become a full professor at a university. It's a remarkable achievement and very worthy of a celebration like this series is intended to be. And in getting here, uh, full professors are people who've made a tremendous contributions to knowledge. They've done important research, scholarship, or creative work. They've disseminated that knowledge, whether through through teaching or writing papers or other means, and by doing that have made a difference in the lives of people. And full professors are truly people who are at the top of their fields. And as such, they're also people who increasingly take on responsibilities for mentorship and for leadership. And I'm reminded of that when I think about my own um, academic journey um, and my experience of, uh, of becoming a professor. Um, and you know, a colleague and I were hired many years ago. Um, at the same time, we started the same day. Um, we were the, the first people hired in a long time in our department and the last people hired for 10 years after that. So for 10 years, we were the youngest people in the room. We were the assistant professors. Everyone else was up there. And then, you know, 
demographics happen, retirements happen. One day we looked around and realized the two of us were the only two full professors in the room. Uh, we looked at each other and we knew who the next two department heads were going to be. Um, so we absolutely look to our faculty um, to become leaders in every respect as they advance. And that's part of what we're celebrating here today. Matt Rudink is one of six at TRU promoted to full professor um, effective this past year. Um, 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 and those six uh, were uh, promoted and we're celebrating one of them tonight, but I do want to mention the names of the others. Um, so the other five are Dr. Courtney Mason in the Department of Tourism Management, Dr. David Hill in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, Dr. Gloria Ramirez in the School of Education, Dr. Carol Reese in the School of Education, and Dr. Natalie Clark in the School of Social Work. Six in one year is a significant number for TRU. Ten years ago in 2012, there were no promotions to full professor at TRU. And in most of the years since then, there typically were one or two people promoted every year. So in recent years, we've seen a growing number and culminating this year with six promotions, giving TRU a total of 37 full professors. So that trajectory over time is a mark of the maturation and the growing impact of our faculty and of our university. I don't doubt that that trend will continue. It's really an indication that our institution is maturing. TRU aims to earn recognition as a research university. And the fact that we're seeing more full professors being promoted every year builds our capacity and our reputation. It's important for the world to know that our faculty have earned the respect of their peers for the work that they've done. And that's why events like this one matter. So as I said at the outset, this is a special occasion, and I look forward to Professor Rudink's lecture. It's not often that we can listen as someone shares the passion of their work, the essence of their work, the things that have fascinated them and have uh, really compelled them to follow their academic journey as far as it's come today. I have a feeling that this is going to be an especially entertaining and enlightening talk. I hope to have the privilege to attend many more of these celebrations in the future. I hope you will too. Thank you very much, Cooks Jen. Thank you, President Fairbairn. I think you have started off in a very great way to talk about the importance and significance of being our first inaugural speaker for a professional lecture series. And you know, this is a, a culmination of many, many years. And the importance of celebrating this with you has been an opportunity for you and for your daughter, who we welcome here today. And I know you, the rest of the family is very proud of what you've done and what your achievements, but they're home looking after a newborn baby girl, so <laughs> a young child. So having you here today is really critical. The president did share that there, this is the first of many, and we'd like to look forward to more full professors. And as you build that corridor of what I call cooperation and collaboration as full professors. There's so much more to gain. So with that, I'd like to thank the president for his words, for his actually continued constant support of our faculty and staff at TRU, our belief in scholarship and research, our belief in the importance of advancement in careers. So thank you, Brett, for that. And I continue to enjoy working with you in that, I call it that journey as TRU moves forward in a very positive way. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, and it's Dr. Greg Anderson, Dean of the Faculty of Science, and invite him to the podium so he can introduce our new next speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Donna, and, and welcome guests. Um, as one might expect from the description of this talk, uh, speaking to the brilliant hues and elaborate displays of birds, Matt is an ornithologist. And for many, that word uh, might be a little vague, but I see all of his students here who can elaborate on what that word means later. His primary research interests are in behavioral ecology and evolution. 
While more is probably known about other types of bird behavior, the role of plumage in, in protection and camouflage, or its role in mating and attracting the, the appropriate mate, Matt's research tries to untangle factors that, inter, uh, that interact to shape the evolution of plumage and the traits that go with that. Um, after a time at, at Willamette and Villanova universities in the US, like the birds he studies, he decided to migrate north and start a family and complete a PhD in Kingston, Ontario. He joined TRU as an assistant professor in 2010. He was promoted to associate professor in 2015. And this year, he was promoted to full professor. As a well-established educator and researcher, Matt currently serves as the co-chair of the Department of Biological Sciences, is the vice president and president-elect of the Society of Canadian Ornithologists, and an elected member of the American Ornithological Society. We're gonna, you know, make you say that really quick five times after. <laughs> As the Dean of the Faculty of Science, my appointment is also in the Department of Biological Sciences. And I'm happy to introduce Matt as a valued colleague and recognize his many contributions to the university community that has given him the status uh, to reach full professor. One contribution is his willingness to engage his students. And I'm very happy to see his students here. <clears throat> his willingness to involve them in his research at all levels. And, and one of the things I think I note when I look at his uh, vitae is that you see a wide array of names at the beginning of all of his publications. And I, I think what's most amazing about that is that many of them are undergraduate students. So congratulations on, on promoting your, your fabulous research and, and having your students involved at, at that high level. So please help me welcome Dr. Rudick, who will present TRU's inaugural prof professorial lecture entitled, Color Evolution Across Time and Space. Thank you, Greg. Well, that's okay. Um, Mark, can I just turn this off for... I don't know how, so <laughs> you good with this, this work? All right, thank you so much, everyone. I am absolutely honored and humbled to be here today and to be the first speaker in this series. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty wild to be standing up here today and to be the one that is allowed to talk about my research. And anytime I have the opportunity to talk about birds, I'm happy. It's not too hard to twist my arm to be able to come up here and do that. But before we get going, I do want to first say thank you to Joanne for that beautiful welcome. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm able to be here to be speaking and to be working on these traditional lands of uh, to Kamloops to Shebekmek. And I also really want to take the moment to acknowledge that much of the research that I'm gonna be talking about is about birds in this region. And without the land, without the people, and without the animals, I wouldn't be able to do this work. And my students and I wouldn't be able to have these careers and research that we're able to have. So I wanna give acknowledgement and I wanna give thanks before I begin. So thank you. All right, and speaking of giving thanks, the ones I really need to thank are the students. Because really this is all about them. While I get to be the one that stands up here and gets celebrated, the reason I'm able to do any of this is because of these fantastic students that I've had while I've been at TRU. And this is only a small portion of the ones that I've put up here in a collage. But when I came to TRU and I was interviewing for my job, I sat in Tom's office and Tom said to me, Matt, I will take our top students and I'll put them against the top students at any university in the world. And I've thought about that ever since. And I completely agree with Tom. We have incredible students. They do incredible things and I am privileged and lucky to be able to work with them. So this is really about honoring them and about honoring the work that they do and that I've been able to do with them. So thanks to all of you that are showing up here too. All right. So one of the challenges when you ask somebody like me to give a talk or you get, ask any professor to give a talk is figuring out what you're gonna talk about. And especially because even though I'm an ornithologist, yes, I study birds, 
I study all sorts of weird things because I get students that come to me and they start to come in with different ideas. Or I talk to Mark Pekow in the back there who says, well, you know, we can use RFID to make smart bird feeders and we can watch how birds move around campus in real time. Or I can start to study migratory connectivity and track birds across space. Or we can study conservation concern of lots of the species that are at risk. So there are lots of different things that I get pulled in different directions. And ultimately, I have a bit of a problem with something called shiny object syndrome, where you know, you're just chasing after the next shiny object. And that, I think that's OK. But the thing that I find the shiniest has to be bird coloration. I mean, look at this. You look at this slide, and birds are colorful. They're fascinating. They're dynamic. And they're beautiful. And they've always captured our imagination. If you look at art, if you look at music, you'll see birds represented all the time. And I think it's just because inherently we find them pretty and fascinating. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's OK to get excited about animals because we inherently find them kind of cool. But when I look at these birds, too, I see this vast array of coloration from these deep vermilion hues all the way to these iridescent colors and the blues and purples and colors that you wouldn't even sketch in a sketchbook. If you had a big array of markers, you wouldn't come up with some of the patterns that we see in birds. And so I asked that question of, well, what has led to this big, vast diversity and array of colors that we see today? And that's a lot of what my work today is going to focus on. But before we do that, we all need to get on the same page so we understand a little bit about bird coloration. So first of all, if we look at the colors in these birds, you'll see a, a brilliant array of, of hues. And they're produced by very different mechanisms. So the blacks and the browns and the grays that you see, and some of the ruddy colors, they're produced by what are called melanin pigments. So melanin is something in our body synthesized normally. This is what makes our hair a different color, our skin a different color. It's just melanin. When the birds grow their feathers, typically at the end of the breeding season, they replace them all. They throw some of that melanin in there. Boom, you've got a black or brown feather. It's pretty easy. But to become colorful, there are a couple different ways to do it. To become red or orange or yellow, you need to deposit something called a carotenoid pigment. Sounds like carrots, because that's why carrots are orange. They have carotenoids in them. Now, carotenoids play a bunch of different functions within your body and your immune system. But for birds, if they're able to, they'll take those carotenoid pigments that they get from the diet, whether from the plants themselves or right into the insects and ultimately into the birds, do a bunch of metabolic conversions in their body, and then shunt them off into the feathers. Now, it just so happens that only the birds that are in good condition, nice and healthy, are the ones that are able to exhibit the really bright, colorful plumage. Now, what about that green or that blue plumage? Well, guess what? That's melanin. That's that black and brown pigment. So why are they blue? Well, it's simply a trick of the light. What's going on is in the feather microstructure, if you arrange those pigments in just the right way, those pigments will absorb the long wavelengths, things like reds and yellows and oranges, and they'll scatter back the blues or the greens. So it's a trick of the light. So if, I, if you ask me, why is a bluebird blue? Well, I'd say it's actually kind of black. It just looks blue to us because of the way in which the pigments are absorbed in the feathers. But that's only kind of part of the story. So if we think about what we see, it's pretty dazzling. It's pretty fascinating. But we're not seeing what the birds see. So for us, if we look at our eyes and we look at the optical system that we have, we have three cones, three photoreceptors in our eyes. And they're, they're sensitive to different wavelengths. So they're sensitive to things that are in the short wavelength, over here at around 400, so in the blue, purplish wavelengths. And then we have a couple photoreceptors that are more sensitive to the longer wavelength. So if we look at something like a minor bird, we look at this and we say, OK, it's black, maybe a little bit iridescent, not super exciting. But we're not looking at it like a bird would look at it. If we look at the cone sensitivity in birds, in other words, we look at the sensitivity of the different photoreceptors, we realize that something weird is going on. They have four instead of three. And that fourth photoreceptor is way over shifted towards these short wavelengths in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So in other words, they can see everything we can see plus a bunch more in the ultraviolet. So if we ask, well, what's the bird see? It's something totally different. But honestly, it's not like that 
because we don't have four cones in our eyes, so we don't know what they actually look like, and we never will, because even if we threw a fourth cone in our eye, we still wouldn't have the neural pathways in order to be able to understand it. So we'll never understand what the birds actually get to see, unfortunately. But it is really cool, and it's very different. The reason that this becomes important when we study plumage, besides the fact that we recognize that birds are seeing something different, is that when we actually study the color and we're looking at variation, either among species or among individuals, we need to do this in an objective way that captures some of that, that variation. And we use something called ultra, or sorry, reflectance spectrometry. This is the tool we use in my lab all the time. And essentially what it is, is it's, you take a light source, you shine a light source out of feather, and you look at what bounces back. And you record what bounces back, and we do this all the way from the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, between 300 and 400 nanometers, and then over to the longer wavelengths. So if we look at something like a bluebird, and we look at the peak that um, comes off the reflectance spectrometry, spectrometer, we see that most of the light is reflected in this peak, with the, the tip of the peak being right on the edge of UV and blue. So are these bluebirds? To us, yes, but to them, they're UV bluebirds. They look totally different. Okay. And that becomes important if we want to objectively quantify the coloration and understand what they're paying attention to. Okay, so I've just given you the groundwork so we can kind of understand the rest of what we're doing through here. And the way I'm gonna break up this talk is to break it into three sections. And the first two are gonna be on case studies in the American Red Start, shown on the left, the Bullock's Oriole in the center, and then finally I'm gonna wrap up by taking a large scale approach to understanding evolution, the evolution of color across all birds. We're going really big at the end here, and this is kind of one of the things I'm focusing on with my current research. So let's start kind of a bit further back for me on the first bird that I started studying way back in 2004, and I'm still studying because it turns out that it's really, really complicated to understand the evolution of the color in American red starts. And by talking about American red starts, I want to focus not just on their coloration during one part of the annual cycle, and by the annual cycle, I mean where birds go throughout the entire year. They're migratory birds, so yes, they breed up here, but then they migrate. They might go hundreds, thousands of kilometers down south to the tropics, spend most of the time down there before coming all the way back up again. And so we really need to think about events that are happening all throughout the year if we want to understand how evolution has shaped the coloration of these animals. And so anytime we're thinking about how color evolved, we have to go back to Darwin, right? We always have to start with Darwin. So, and I like this picture of Darwin. We always see Darwin as a stodgy old man, but we have to remember he was also a family man, right, Autumn? And so <laughs> what I would say is that with Darwin, so when Darwin was talking about the evolution of coloration, the evolution of ornaments and armaments. He was, and he was developing his theory of sexual selection. He looked at this colorful thing, he would say, well, these males are probably colorful because they're trying to attract mates. And if that's the case, we should see that the more colorful males are the ones that are more successful in attaining mates. It's pretty straightforward, right? We have a population of birds, we look at the preference, we see the more colorful ones are generally preferred by the females. Now, it seems, pretty straightforward, but we have to recognize that these systems are much more complex than we might give them credit for. For a long time, we looked at species like the American Red Star and all these other, um, what we call socially monogamous birds. We said, you know what, these are some good dads. They take care of the babies, they feed the, um, they work with the mom to protect the nest, to feed the offspring. They are good and monogamous. Yeah, kind of. What we have to remember is a social monogamy, where you have a male and female that pair up and take care of babies. It's not always the same with genetic monogamy. And these birds, like many others, about 90% of uh, bird species, are notorious philanderers. Any chance they get, they will try to seek extra pair copulations, which is basically a fancy way of saying they cheat on their spouse, right? And so. As soon as the, female, the male and female pair up, the female's laid her eggs, that male's advertising. He's trying to attract more females. Now, 
don't get me wrong, the females have a huge part to play in this because if she's not paired up with a high quality male, if that male's looking a bit drab, not too pretty, she will actively solicit and look for extra pair copulations. Guess whom, who from? More attractive males, right? Now, with a system like the American Red Start, we realize that there's a lot of extra pair paternity, there's a lot of fooling around going on, but at the same time, these males will try their very best to gain a second female. They're not content with one, they try to get a second female. So we have kind of mostly monogamy, but then polygyny when we can get it, and lots of extra pair paternity. The point behind all this is that if we wanna say, is color under selection right now? Do females really prefer more colorful males? We really under, have to understand the genetics. We have to do paternity testing. Right? And this is exactly you know, your terrible daytime television shows where they give the results of the paternity analysis. That's exactly what we're talking about. So we catch all the males, we catch all the females in the population, we put little color bands on, you can see on their legs right there, and that allows us to look through binoculars and take a look quick and easy and see who the parents are there and see if somebody that's not supposed to be around is. But then we have to also get DNA samples from the babies. It turns out with something like a red start, that's not as easy to do. What you're not seeing in this picture, where I'm way up at the top here, kind of camouflage, is that there are two ropes that are strung way back and tied to undergrads. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't at TRU, I didn't do this here. Okay. So once we finally get up there, we take, us, we take the babies, we put bands on their legs, we know who each of them is, and we run the paternity analysis. Now what we should see is that the males that are polygynous should have more colorful plumage, the males that sire their own offspring should be more colorful, and the males that sire offspring in other males' nests should also be very, very colorful. But when we look at the data, it turns out to be really, really confusing. So yes, color matters. If we look at something like tail brightness, how bright that tail is, it's directly related to polygyny. Males with bright tails are more likely to be polygynous. As soon as we look at paternity, you see, all I want you to see is that there are arrows that are going different directions. Some relationships are positive, some are negative. It depends on the metric we use. It's a whole big mess, and we don't really get it. And so I've spent the next, after doing this, the 12, lots of years, I don't know, well over a decade, trying to untangle and discover why this is going on. And so in 2015, one of my students and I put out this paper where we looked at all our different papers and all the different, well, this is actually just a subset of, of the different papers that we had published, trying to understand plumage and the different relationships. <sighs> and it's just positive relationships, negative relationships. It's all over the map and nothing seems to make sense. I don't think Darwin would be, be well, actually Darwin probably would be excited because it's a question without an answer yet. So luckily that's kind of what I thought too. You know, this is kind of cool. But now we need to know the mechanism. We need to understand at a larger scale what's influencing this variation. Why are these patterns confusing? And so we've looked at some of these larger patterns that might influence color. And it turns out that things like weather are really important. If we have a large data set, over 10 years of data, we can look how color fluctuates from year to year in these birds. And it turns out that in years that you have high rainfall, warm temperatures, well, that produces lots of insects that's good for, these, um, good for the birds. They eat all these insects and they create colorful plumage at the end of the breeding season that they come back with the next year. So year after year, we get this variation in color. But individuals themselves are changing from one year to the next. Now these birds are a little bit weird in that in their first breeding season, the males look just like females. They're not very lucky. In the second year of life, they become this black and orange. And then they're really, really colorful in their first year as black and orange, they start to go downhill. So this probably explains some of the patterns that we see. Yes, the males that are uh, bright orange are attractive to the females, but these really old males, even though they're kind of dull now, the females often seek them out as extra pair partners because these are old males with good genes that work really well in the population. So we're starting to kind of get a little bit of clarity on the mechanisms. And with Kingsley Doncor and Jocelyn Houdon at the Royal Alberta Museum, we've been starting to look into the chemistry to understand what the underlying basis, biochemical basis of these colors are. And it turns out that some of the problems are probably because we may have been using some of the wrong metrics to really quantify this coloration. This is how you end up gaining a career as a professor, I guess, is you keep being wrong and then you keep 
try new things. But that's what makes science exciting and what makes science fun. Now, just as a quick aside, because um, this is about birds that we are studying over in Ontario, I do want to bring this close to home and just mention that we've also been studying um, bluebirds ever since I got here. We've been studying mountain bluebirds and we've been studying their coloration. And remember, blue, totally different uh, system of how it becomes colorful, right? It's based on melanin that they're getting in their body and diet anyway. But as it, and as it turns out, you know, females do pay attention to this coloration as a kind of cool one. Females that are mated to more colorful males end up producing more sons than daughters. Yeah, it's a little something called the sexy sons hypothesis. So if you're with an attractive male, you're gonna, pro you're gonna produce attractive sons. Um, I didn't coin that term, that is a term in the literature. Okay, and as it turns out, both age and weather, just like what we saw with the red starts with carotenoid-based coloration, also influence the expression of bluebird coloration. So it gets very complicated very, very quickly, but some of these patterns seem to be universal, and they're often ones that people don't pay attention to when especially you're doing a snapshot study, say in one year. Okay, so you need to look big, you need to think big. But so far, I've only talked about breeding. But the breeding season's short. It's just a couple months out of the year where, you know, the, where plumage might be important, during you know, mid-May through the beginning of July when the females are choosing males, but they're stuck with this bright black and orange plumage throughout the whole rest of the year. And in fact, a majority of the year, these birds spend on the wintering grounds. And so my question was, well, how does plumage work during the winter? Is it functioning during the winter? Is it under selection? Do birds care about it? Do other birds pay attention to color during the winter? So, to do this, you know, this is rough, but during the winters, I have to go to Jamaica sometimes. <laughs> and so my, my PhD, one of my PhD supervisors, Pete Mara, was at the Smithsonian. He has this long uh, study population, over 30 years now, that he's been studying American red starts on the wintering ground in Jamaica. And it's an incredible study system because much of the areas that we work in have mangrove habitat that's right next to scrub. Now this is important for the birds because mangrove habitat, like this red mangrove and black mangrove forest, is an incredible place to be if you're a bird. It's wet, there's lots of moisture throughout the year. The trees themselves are evergreen, so it's always shady in here. It's cooler and there are lots of insects to eat. If you walk literally a few meters over, it's like a jigsaw between mangrove habitat and scrub. And in this scrub, it's this rough, nasty environment where there, especially later in the summer, it loses all its leaves. There's lots of UV radiation. It's scraggly. The birds are looking kind of ragged by the time they've been living in here for a while. And yet, we'll find American red starts in both the mangrove habitat and the scrub. And they're each individual, male and female, is holding its own tiny little territory. So what enables a bird to get into the mangrove and what enables, or what enables a bird to get into this mangrove habitat, hold a territory and not let any of the rest of them out? And this is where I thought that maybe plumage plays a role and maybe it's helping to mediate access to these high quality territories. So, let me just step back and give an example with a bird we might be familiar with. Everybody familiar with house sparrows? The, the kind of invasive species, little brown and, and white and black. They've got black bibs on them. So they're the birds, if you're out on the patio in the summer eating food, they'll kind of come up right next and steal your crumbs away, right? If you look closely at them next time, you'll see that some have tiny little bibs. Some have big bibs. It turns out that the size of that bib directly correlates to its competitive ability, its fighting ability. And so, if you've got a tiny little bib and you come up against a male or a female that has a big bib, do you fight? No, you back down because you know you're going to get your butt kicked if you try to fight with that other individual. Meanwhile, if you've got a big bib, the only person you're really going, or bird you're going to engage with, is another one with a big bib. And so maybe this coloration on uh, red starts is acting in the same way. And the reason we think this might be possible, I have to move over here really quickly, because if we watch red starts as they move throughout their environment, we'll see that their tails flick up quite a bit. Okay? And you see that there's this huge 
orange patch on their tails. And when they get into agonistic interactions, in other words, when they get into fights, like at the edge of the territory, they'll flare them up. And so we think that the birds might be paying attention to that signal, right? And giving an indication of whether this is a high quality individual, a low quality, whether it's worth engaging in a fight. Because you really never want to engage in a fight unless you really have to, because it's going to be costly. So if that's the case, what we should see is that the birds in the higher quality territories are more colorful than the birds in that low quality scrub type habitat. And that's exactly what we do see. And it doesn't matter if you're the young gray and yellow males or if you're the older black and orange males, if you're in the high quality territories, you're more likely to be much more colorful. So we think that this coloration is acting as a signal for mating but also to communicate among males and between males and females, indicating an individual's uh, fighting ability. So in other words, what this gives us a bit of insight into is the fact that color is probably being shaped by factors that are, that are occurring during the breeding season, absolutely, but probably throughout the rest of the year too. But now this is where I think it gets pretty cool because we can also ask, well, how does living in a high quality territory or a low quality territory ultimately translate back to the breeding season? How does it carry over from the winter all the way back to the summer? And some of the work that Pete has done, uh, Pete Mara, who I mentioned before, has done, has shown that the birds that are in the mangrove habitat, they're in good condition. They're much lower, they have fewer stress hormones. Uh, they don't lose weight over the winter compared to the birds in the scrub type habitat. Um, ultimately, they have higher survival if they're in the higher quality habitat. But I really want to know how that translates into breeding success because ultimately that's the metric uh, for evolution. Whether or not you're successful is how well you breed. The trick is how do you track a seven gram bird from Jamaica all the way up to the breeding grounds? Now we are doing better with miniaturizing tracking devices. I'll talk a little bit about tracking later. But for this, if we really are caring about what type of habitat they're in, we can take a shortcut. And it turns out that you are what you eat. And anyone familiar with chemistry probably knows the term isotope. And so if we look at isotopes of carbon, this is just, you take carbon-12, you add a neutron, you've got carbon-13, it's stable in the environment. And it tends to vary based on habitat. So if we take a bird that's living in that scrub, we take a sample of its blood or its claws, it's completely different than the birds in the mangrove. Luckily, if we choose the right tissue, like a claw, they retain that all the way through migration until they get to the breeding grounds. So we catch that bird on the breeding grounds, take a look at the carbon isotope signatures, and guess what? Now we know what kind of habitat it was in during the winter. So is that important? Well, as it turns out, the birds that come from these high quality wet habitats, right, the mangrove type habitats, the much wetter ones, arrive on the breeding ground significantly earlier than the birds coming from the poor quality habitat. All right, so they arrive earlier on the breeding grounds. Why does that matter? That matters because it's directly related to reproductive success. The birds that retain paternity, in other words, they are actually the fathers of all their own offspring, they on average arrive about five, eh, four or five days earlier than the birds that lose paternity. So if you can establish a territory right away, advertise to females, gain access to females, you're good, you're set. These males that arrive late, they're competing with all these other males they are trying to attract a second female too. Now, it gets even more complicated if we look at polygyny. So your ability to have more than one female. And here what we see is that the males that are polygynous arrive really early. If you arrive late, your chance of being polygynous is basically zero. Now this is huge for a male red start because you can essentially double your reproductive output by pairing with more than one female. So taken together, what I hope this, this part on the red starts demonstrates is that if we want to understand the evolution of color or any of these other traits of migratory birds, we need to take a holistic approach. We need to take an approach that looks at all these events and factors that are occurring throughout the entire annual cycle. And I haven't even mentioned what's going on during migration. That still remains a black box. So there's always going to be more to do. Okay, so that's the red starts. Now, one of the, the things I mentioned is that the red starts, like so many other birds, they molt their feathers at the end of the breeding season. So they breed, 
At that point, they've raised their babies. Now they have to replace all the feathers. They need to look good for the rest of the year or for the next year. Not all birds do it that way, though. The bird that lives around here that does something really unique, oops, sorry, is a bird called the Bullock's Oriole, another brilliantly colored bird that's black and orange. And if you want to see them around here, the places to go are either to the Rivers Trail or there's an RV park up on Highway 5A, packed full of them. That was our main study location. All right. So what makes the Bullock's Orioles so fascinating is that they breed up here, but as soon as mm, about mid-July hits, they're out of here. They leave. They don't stick around to molt. What they do instead is actually travel down south to southwestern United States, northwestern Mexico. Then they hang out there for a couple months, molt all their feathers, replace all their feathers, and then take another trip further south into Mexico to spend the whole winter before coming all the way back again. And this is a phenomenon that we call molt migration. And what makes molt migration so cool is that it's uncommon. And if we look at a phylogenetic tree of all the birds, all the migratory birds in North America, this is a phylogenetic tree. It's, it's basically a visual representation of all the relationships among all the uh, 200 or something uh, bird species that we have, migratory bird species in North America. What I want you to notice is that Branches that are close together indicate close relationships, further apart, less closely related. All these black dots indicate molt migratory songbirds. So this has evolved multiple times. They're far, far away on the phylogenetic tree. And so there must be some universal thing that's driving the evolution of this behavior. Now, as it turns out, if you're, you're probably kind of getting a guess of what this might be because you live in Kamloops, it's aridity. It's how dry the conditions are at the end of the breeding season. If you're in Kamloops in July and August, it's dry, it's gross, there's not a lot to eat if, if you're a bird. And in fact, if we compare the birds that are uh, molt migrants to those that are not, like here's a closely related pair of a Bullock's Oriole on the left, Baltimore Oriole on the right, and we look at the conditions in late summer and how green it is, this is using something called NDVI. It's basically remote sensing data that gives us a sense of the, how green that habitat is. Well, look, Baltimore Orioles, totally green. Might as well stick around. There's food available. No problem. Bullock's Orioles, it's brown. It's not a great place to be. And so we categorize this as something that we call a push-pull hypothesis that drives the evolution of this pattern. So the push is it's really dry here at the end of the season in the arid west. And so for a lot of these birds, there's not a lot to eat, it's better to go south, and they get pulled in to this part of what we call the Mexican monsoon region for a very good reason. It's because in the late summer, you get these huge monsoon rains that absolutely transform the landscape, going from something that looks a bit like Kamloops in early July, but look how quickly, within a couple weeks, it completely transforms into what looks like a tropical oasis that is full of fruits, it's full of insects, this is a place you want to be if you need to go through something that's really energetically costly, like replacing all of your feathers. And so that's exactly why we think the birds go down here, but we need to verify it. And to verify it, we are able, because these birds are a little bit bigger, we're able to use a little te a technique called geolocation. So what you're seeing on the back of this Bullock's Oriole is what's called a light level geolocator. It's a little... Um, it's a data logger that has a light sensor at the end of a stalk that records the day length. So you have sunrise and sunset for every day. Now, if we put this out in Kamloops, we know what our day length is, and we also know the relative time that it should be. But as this bird travels south, or if it travels east and west, the day lengths are gonna change, and the relative timing of that day is going to change. And so we can use that information to calibrate and to figure out where these birds have been migrating. And if we look at a couple examples of these Bullock's Orioles, yep, they leave here end of July, just as we would expect. They hop down in the Mexican monsoon region. They acquire lots of their nutrients down here in, in this Mexican monsoon region where they stay for two months in order to molt their feathers before finally going down south to spend the rest of the winter. Now on a completely different side note, we, Steve, put out a bunch of geolocators on, on bluebirds last year, so hope, well, We'll get a bit of data and then we're putting out a bunch more. So we're gonna know a bunch more about bluebirds here real soon. 
Going back to the Orioles, sorry, it's just an aside. Uh, one of the, a couple things to note here. One is that that green blob where they're molt migrating differs between these two birds that are in the same breeding population. And it's a big blob because there's a bit of uncertainty. But they're spending two months there doing something that's absolutely critical for the rest of the year to be able to gain this beautiful coloration. And so the question is, does the diet and does their behavior during this part of the year influence the coloration that they're able to acquire that will last them the rest of the year? And so again, we used some stable isotope analysis looking at carbon because that varies between with water stress, but also some nitrogen because nitrogen varies with where you eat on the trophic level. So if I look at somebody that's a total carnivore and I pluck a hair because you are what you eat, we would see that it's very high and very enriched in nitrogen in the stable isotope of nitrogen. Somebody that's a vegetarian or a vegan would be much lower. And so we can use this information to get a sense of what these birds are eating and whether that influences their color. And what we end up seeing, if I can, oops, is that the birds that have lower nitrogen signatures end up having a hue that's more enriched in orange. It's more colorful, more saturated. So in other, what we think is going on is that the birds that have these lower nitrogen signatures are probably relying more heavily on fruits that are rich in carotenoids. But if we start to look into the chemistry, it gets a bit more complicated because it's not about how much carotenoids you have, it's about which specific ones that are creating the color that you actually need. So there's a whole lot more we can do with this system, but it gives you a sense of how important it is to think about where these birds are actually getting their, uh, the nutrients that they need in order to become colorful. And sometimes this is happening very, very far, hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from the place they breed. So all these parts of the annual cycle are connected. And if we want to understand color, we need to connect the dots between them. So with that, I'll wrap up this little section and just tell you briefly where we're going next. So what we've learned from these two small scale studies tells us mostly what we don't know and perhaps where we need to go next. The issue is that if you're taking single species studies, you can get a lot of information, but what if those birds are just kind of weird? What if those birds don't act like the rest of them do? And are there perhaps some larger overarching factors that influence coloration across all birds? So remember, if we go back to this diversity that I, that I showed before, are there certain attributes of where they live and how they behave, what they eat, that might ultimately drive the diversity that we see on Earth with all these different colors? And a couple years ago, I went on sabbatical down in New Zealand. And when I was down there, we were on a big island. So the question became, what about islands? Are islands important? And does I, oops. Sorry, does island living perhaps drive color evolution? Now, I'm not coming up with this totally out of the blue. This is a question that other people have, have thought about before. And part of the reason we started thinking about this was because I was trying to come up with a good study that we could do when I was in New Zealand. And my whole family was there. It was pretty fun. And we we're trying to think of what birds do you study? Well, here's the thing. The birds in New Zealand are absolutely adorable. I mean, look at that thing. That's South Island Robin. Super cute, but not very colorful. And that's a bit of a bummer because if we compare it to its close relatives on the mainland, like the pink robin and the Australasian robin, look at those things. They, I mentioned a coloring book before. If you picked out markers, would you draw those? No, they'd say those aren't unrealistic. They're very, very colorful. And so this is a pattern that we see over and over again, though, that most of these birds on islands tend to be kind of dull and kind of drab. And people have noted this over and over again. If you know pretty much anything about Darwin, you heard about his travels, you probably have heard about the Darwin's finches as well. And if you don't know too much about them, I hate to burst your bubble, but they're kind of boring looking. They're drab, they're brown, they're blackish. They're not very exciting looking. They're fascinating evolutionarily, but they're not very exciting looking. And this is a pattern that we see over and over again. But most of the studies that have been done have looked at this in the sense of looking at a particular group of islands or maybe a relatively limited sample of 100 or so birds um, across a larger scale to see whether or not this is a generalizable pattern. That's not good enough. I want to go really big. I want to look across all birds, or at least all passerines. 
There's still 6,000 of them. I think that's pretty good, pretty big sample. The challenge is, if we want to say, are birds on islands dull? Does island living change the color of birds? Well, we run into this problem where animals are related to each other. Just like we went to do, Nancy, as a statistician, would agree with this, that brothers and sisters are not independent data points. They're related. Well, evolutionarily, the same goes for related species. So if we find that a couple species are really bright, like maybe species two and species three over there, well, we can't count them as independently evolving bright coloration because they're related. Right? So we need to figure out a technique that takes into account these evolutionary relationships, and they're related in amongst all these species. To do that, we need to have a phylogeny. We need to have a backbone for all our analyses that allows us to control for the relationships among all the species in our 6,000 passeriforms. These are the, the perching birds, the songbirds. And use that as a backbone in any future analysis to ask, are birds on islands less colorful than those on the mainland? Now, the other problem is that we need to find a way to quantify the coloration of 6,000 something birds. Now, my undergrads are amazing. They do huge amounts of work, but that's probably asking a little bit much. Not to mention that the, mention that the bill for airline flights to all the museums across the world, it, it's not tenable. But luckily, Jim Dale, another New Zealand researcher, came up with a really cool technique. And this is kind of a shortcut. So what he did is take the Handbook of the Birds of the World, which is a resource that we as ornithologists often use, and each of them has a plate. It has a picture of, of a bird that's a painting that's a pretty good visual representation of that bird. He created a computer program that picked out hundreds or thousands of data points all throughout the upper part of that bird, used that to extract red, green, blue values, RGB values, and through his whole analysis, come up with a single value for every single uh, passer in, in the world. So we have really colorful ones with high values, not so colorful ones with low values. It's a shortcut. It turns out that it, it correlates really, really well with reflectance spectrometry you know, the, the right technique to use. The only problem that I saw with this technique, though, is it treats birds that become colorful by taking on carotenoid pigments the same way as birds that become colorful because they have structural pigments. But those mechanisms are totally different. So I don't, we didn't think that that was really the best way to go about it, so we contacted Jim, and he gave us his raw data, and we, caught, we collected, or we took that and extracted what we call chromaticity scores that gives us a value for red and a value for blue. So we think that this might help be a little bit more informative for us. So using all this information, 6,000 bird species, what do we actually find? Well, we find that the pattern holds up, but it gets really cool, at least in my mind. So, oh, there is a map back there. You can't see it, but there is. Those are all islands. So what happens if we look at red chromaticity is that uh, females that are on the mainland are much more colorful than females that are on the islands. Males that are on the mainland are much more colorful than males that are on islands. So oh, there we have it now. <laughs> All right, so, so we do get this change. Birds are less colorful on islands. That's fantastic. But where it gets really interesting to me is that if we look at chromaticity of the, the blue chromaticity, we actually see an increase. So they're becoming more colorful on islands. So I think what might be happening is that we're getting a switch. We're saying instead of using carotenoids, maybe they become colorful in a different way to attract mates by using structural coloration that doesn't rely on gaining these dietary pigments in order to become colorful. Now, the only challenge with doing something like this this big is that we're lumping lots of different stuff together, like uh, the corvids, ravens, crows, jays, and magpies, along with uh, warblers or finches. So maybe we need to look at this a little bit finer scale, say at the family level. And if we do that now, it gets really messy. Now we have things that are going in all sorts of directions, probably telling us that selection and evolution is really acting at this narrower level within a family or perhaps even down a bit lower in a genus. Now, I've only been talking about one single factor, island living. As you can imagine, there's so much more to do. And what we're doing in my lab right now is incorporating all these other potential uh, factors that might influence the evolution of color, migration, diet, habitat, social system, 
all these different factors, we can put them together into these analyses to ask how they all interact with each other and ultimately contribute to the evolution of the color that we see in birds. So where are we going with it? Well, we're going to keep, keep digging with this data set because it's huge. And I have, it's all based on my undergrads that have done so much work to put this massive data set together. And we've been playing with it to try to figure out what we can learn from it. But this analysis of taking a large scale phylogenetic approach is super powerful and allows us to go beyond birds. I know it's hard to believe, but we can go beyond birds. And we can ask questions about other organisms like bats. And my students and I right now are working on things with bats, not to ask about their coloration, but to ask if we can predict why bat species, which are just going through these catastrophic declines, well, why are some species more likely to experience declines than others? So we can look at the biological and ecological predictors of extinction risk. And hopefully for these bats we know almost nothing about, we can predict whether they might be vulnerable and to enact different conservation measures. All right, I've given you a lot of information. So with that, I am going to say thank you with a very special thanks to the three best field assistants I could ever ask for and the future field assistant right there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I don't think there are anybody in here who doesn't know me, uh, it's been my enormous pleasure to have Matt as a colleague uh, since he arrived here. Um, and it was, thank, I want to thank the organizers of this for letting me thank him and to reflect a little bit on what he's done and also reflect a little bit about this professorial promotion that he just uh, was able to successfully uh, undergo. And so uh, thinking about that, they said, you should be a peer. Well, um, there's a number of stories I could tell on that, on that regard. But Matt and I have taught a course together, and several of the students are here. Um, Matt's been very, very um, good about including me on his uh, honors and graduate students examining committees and supervisory committees. Uh, we actually share a very strong link ornithologically to uh, the Canadian Society of Ornithologists. As it turns out, uh, I was a treasurer for about 15 years, and Matt showed up in my office one day and said, Tom, they've asked me to be the treasurer of the Canadian Society of Ornithologists. And, and he was very excited. And, and, and so we share that. Uh, and I guess on the side, I was nominally your boss for... Uh, a dozen years, so so I, I feel like I can offer some of those peer evaluation uh, things. But as you go undergo uh, this promotion uh, review, you have to show your worth in all sorts of different areas, but in particular in the area of service, in the area of teaching, and in the area of research. And Matt has excelled in all of those areas as the research thing you just heard about is clear, but he's also been an enormous value to the institution for, in a number of different ways. Um, you're uh, an associate or a part of the chairship for biology, and that's greatly appreciated for the service you've given the university that way. Uh, at the national level through the Canadian Society of Ornithologists. You've taken a leadership role and you've been acknowledged for it as you have been in the uh, American Ornithological Society. And uh, all of that uh, leads up to something that shines a very bright light on our institution. Um, your role and the work that you've done in service has uh, raised our prestige among some of the colleagues that I have across North America. And I want to thank you for that. So that's part of my thank you. Uh, <laughs> my other thank you is, is one that comes from the teaching side of the house. And we have taught together. And one of the things that I have been, and as a matter of fact, just as a reflection, uh, Matt was hired the year that I became the Dean of Science, and he taught all the courses 
that I ended up having on my portfolio to teach. And so I can honestly say that he's improved all the courses that used to exist in, uh, in biological sciences, especially in the, in the realm of the currency that they have, because he has this enthusiasm to make sure that what he's teaching is not only the most current, but engaging to students. And having been in the classroom with you, I can honestly attest to the fact that the students that you teach are engaged and are very thankful for what you uh, are able to give them. From a different point of view and the mentorship point of view, I know that you've put enormous amount of work into mentoring students, and I know the gratitude that they have with regard to that. And in particular, you should be very, very proud about the number of students that have actually got great jobs and that have gone on and done uh, further graduate work and it's only because of the enthusiasm that you actually instilled in them. And I want to thank you as well. So, and I could go on about that, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, when, when uh, you, I think it was your interview day, I'm not sure about it, uh, you mentioned being in my office and I telling you that we, our students would stand up to anybody in the world. Well, you know, we came over here for lunch, and I think we sat about where Greg is. And uh, for about an hour, we had lunch, and we rampled on and on and on about birds. And afterwards, when you had gone off with somebody who picked you up and taken you away, one of the staff, who was a friend of mine, came out and said, I heard you guys talking. Is he your son? <laughs> So a generation has passed, and, and in fact, uh, uh, I've felt very close, and thank you again for all the opportunities you've given me and other uh, faculty member to be involved with some of the students that you've been uh, mentoring. But I think the thing that stands out, <laughs> and the thing that I want to point out, is uh, the research, the enthusiasm that Matt has for colors and birds is, is beyond compare, I think. And, and uh, the organization in your mind about the kinds of questions that still need to be answered and how you can engage students in those questions is really what came across to me in that presentation. Just before we started, as it turns out, Autumn and Matt and I were the only ones in the, in the room. And Matt says to me, he says, what do you think Darwin would think about <laughs> This. And I said, you know, just like you said, it's an unanswered question. There's millions of unanswered questions. And, and Darwin was wonderful about uh, seeing ways to do experiments and to test different hypotheses about how things occur. And uh, I think he'd be very proud of you, Matt, because that uh, idea of taking nature and the unanswered questions in nature, and being able to use the most sophisticated and current tools to be able to dissect out the different alternative explanations and come up with the ones that are most likely are the things that I think uh, is your legacy of studying Darwin and also uh, what you've done. And what I've seen in your research and what I'm so impressed with is what you've been able to do by staying current and a scholar uh, of all the different work that's being done in the field and to find the techniques. And even if they have only, not quite as Mark would point out, be quite honed to the sophistication that's necessary to locate a bird in a particular place, the, you've used the uh, most current techniques and the most uh, recently developed skills and technologies to actually address some of these questions. And you keep doing it. And the better the tools get, the better your answers are. And so um, I know there may be some questions, but I wanted to make sure that I came across with those thank yous on all of those grounds. Uh, I thank you for um, your students, on your students' behalf. I thank you on your colleagues' behalf for being so inclusive in what you do. And I thank you from the administrative point of view because you have a very bright light on our institution.
So thank you very much, Matt. Wait a minute. Where's the swipes? We gotta wipe this down. You see, we're conscientious, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, as usual, to have a response of that nature for our first inaugural professional lecture, I think, Dr. Rudick, you've been treated well. <laughs> that uh, who could speak more highly and with more dedication to what you have accomplished? And as the interim provost, one of the things that I can say is that you walked this audience through from the simplicity start of what you wanted to answer. And as each step of the way during this, you engage this audience in knowledge, inquiry, methodology, both quantitative and qualitative, the importance of opening on our eyes to opportunities, the opportunity for students to think deeply. And once you think you have the answer, He's saying to you, what's the next question that we didn't answer yet? And so it's been a phenomenal full time here. And I know there's opportunities for a couple of questions, if you'd like, or we could have it as people enjoy some food. It's up to you. Which Anybody have some burning question or comment that you would like to make before we close the formal piece? You're welcome. Don't be shy. Mark, of course. <laughs> I must to be a great presentation, by the way. I may take up uh, bird fluid myself. <laughs> Especially the spectroscopy part. That's, yeah. uh, there seems to be sort of a circular thing here. You're saying the more colorful birds have the better area, but the better area also leads to more colorful birds. So. Not in the winter. Sorry if I wasn't clear on that. So they actually, they, so for the red starts, they grow their feathers at the end of the breeding season up north in North America. And so when they go down south, it's based on what they already have down there. So it doesn't lead to more color. Interesting. So yeah. then they, but they, they maintain it because they're in the better habitat, which then brings it, them back up to get better habitat. It doesn't change it too much. So they, it basically remains, all birds get a little bit drabber throughout the year from the very start that they got their feathers to when they come back, but it doesn't change very much. The feathers are inert, right? So the birds that are in the, the really bright areas, the, the kind of sunny, harsh areas, they do get a bit more UV exposure, but not enough to shift it totally away. Okay, thank you for that question. That was great. Any other burning questions from anybody? I have to ask Autumn. What would you like to say to your dad? Nothing. <laughs> perfect. 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 Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think this will close the formal event. It's time to take some opportunity to speak to Dr. Rudick about his um, opportunities, his beliefs, his dreams, and his continued scholarship at TRU. And please welcome, uh, there's food provided by the culinary that's down there just waiting for you. So please, uh, let's have a round of applause for our first inaugural professorship. <laughs> <laughs>